are basically asked in cycle one to target the two equatorial candles fields, Cosmos and UDS, uh, and to produce a, a data set that was maybe slightly different from what's being targeted in the other candles fields. The key thing here I'd like to stress is, is homogeneity. As much as we can, the fields are covered by uh, contiguous NAVCAM uh, wave bands uh, and also certainly in COSMOS, but um, as much as we can in UDS as well, also with overlapping MIRI imaging. So most of the survey is 10 band imaging and that differs a lot from what's available elsewhere. Uh, we got all we asked for, which was lovely. Uh, we asked for, it for science in cycle one, but also to provide a massive finding chart for future spectroscopy in subsequent cycles. That was one of the arguments to do this early. And that 178 hours of execution time contains 95 hours of science time with NERCAM and 100 hours of science time with MIRI. And formally, we've set it up with MIRI in prime and the NERCAM's in parallel. But basically, all of it, it's a full 100% parallel program with the prime time as well. So formally, it's actually more than 100% efficient. Uh, and it turns out to be the largest of the Cycle 1 Galaxies proposals uh, and one of the three largest overall, I think, in Cycle 1. So we've got complete broadband NERCAM coverage and we've also thrown in the 410M medium band filter as well and the, the red end of NERCAM, which is useful for distinguishing uh, BAMA breaks from emission lines. And after a lot of agonising, we fixed on two MIRI MIRI bands, the 7.7, .7 or I've said here, 8 micron band, which is far enough away from NERCAM to make an impact, and the 18 micron band, which gives us some leverage and some colour information for separating AGN from uh, star forming galaxies. And so because it's so sort of contiguous and organised and with maximum overlap, it turns out to give you 20 times the area of fully sampled 10-band imaging compared to the other programmes. It doesn't go quite as deep as some of the GTO, uh, but it is um, very even in terms of coverage. And when we run these um, simulations, empirical simulations, no surprise here that most of the galaxies we'll uncover haven't been seen by either Hubble or, or Spitzer. The other thing is, although, although the program reaches 29th magnitude, a lot of it is to 28 and 28 and a half. And actually, it's, a, it's an imaging survey whose depth is rather well matched to what you can do with the NERF spec if you're looking for emission line galaxies at high redshifts. And the majority of, of the objects we'll uncover at redshift 7, for example, can be uh, imaged and, sorry, detect all three with expected equivalent widths in about an hour with no spec. So that's another reason to do it in cycle one. Uh, some of the science, most of it's fairly obvious to many people on the call. I mean, we did include the 090W filter to enable us to do redshift seven selection. So you can see an example here of a redshift seven galaxy. Here's the filter coverage with NERCAM, the broad bands, and the medium band there. Um, and this just shows the way you can cycle through redshift 7, redshift 8, redshift 10, and even uh, the, the, wave, the wave band information you've got can distinguish a blue redshift 10 galaxy from maybe the reddest redshift 10 galaxy. You could imagine this example here is formed at redshift 15 is in a burst, so it's 200 mega years old. So even within, as well as good photos edge, you actually should get some uh, information on the ages of these highest range of galaxies. Uh, and then adding the, the MIRI, we worked a lot on this to work out what the added value was, because of the, although the NERCAM imaging gets to 28 or 29 AB magnitude, depending on where you are in the image, realistically, the MIRI imaging, even at eight microns, only gets down to about 25 and a half. But it turns out, that can still be crucial for red galaxies. So here's an example, uh, red galaxy without any media information, but simulated with all the NERCAM information. And you can see three alternative SEDs, all consistent with the NERCAM imaging. We were kind of surprised that you could actually fail to distinguish even a ridge of two galaxy from a ridge of five galaxy uh, with all this deep NERCAM power. <laughs> Uh, but if you add the 8 micron or the 7.7 .7 micron data in this case, everything tidies up and the truth is revealed to be a, a ridge of five galaxy with reasonable ridge of constraints for such a featureless red object. 
So if you want to tidy up uh, dusty galaxies at ridge of two from more passive galaxies at ridge of five, it turns out that this uh, media imaging can be really important. And the fact it doesn't get quite as deep doesn't really matter for very red objects. You can see here the estimated error bar can, can still do the job. Uh, we have a lot of dynamic range because we set up the MIRI imaging, but by the time you drag the, um, the NIRCAM across, you get a range of depths. So you get a deep section, a medium section, and a shallow section. And this just shows the sort of numbers of galaxies we should get in the survey at these high redshifts, redshifts 7 to 12. Um, it's a log plot, so beware here. The deep bit is actually quite a bit smaller than the medium bit. But you can see here that the statistics will be impressive, so we'll be doing proper science at ridge of seven and eight with galaxies samples about 10 times bigger than before. And even at the very high ridge of here, we'll be distinguishing the sort of thing that is currently still debated in the literature, whether galaxy evolution extends out to very high ridge of due to more, something approximating more luminosity evolution, or whether it dies off more rapidly beyond ridge of 10 as consistent with density evolution. So in one case here, you've got over three dozen galaxies at ridge of 11 in the other case here, you get single figures. The other thing, of course, a, a number of people in the call have sweated over trying to work out the UV continuum slopes of galaxies. I guess a holy grail here is finding something with a UV slope of minus three or even bluer, which is very hard to, uh, to uh, identify with anything other than a dust-free, metal-free population. And the, the leverage here compared to Hubble, where you just had these three near infrared bands very close together. Once you get the, the NERCAM bands, you can distinguish quite easily a very blue galaxy from a less blue galaxy with kind of 5% error in the slopes. Mass functions, all the rage for JWST. So we get we can distinguish alternative mass functions at reds of seven because we're of course doing rest frame optical infrared. Uh, and I won't go into the details here too much, but also intermediate redshifts, you can get right down the mass function below 10 to the 10 to distinguish whether you have uh, any quaint slow mass galaxies or whether it's all just high mass galaxies. And, and this can tell you a lot about when things like environmental quenching kick in or don't. Um, and lots of other signs, I mean, uh, most people on the call will be able to figure out what they could do with 10 band imaging reaching 29th magnitude in the deepest bands. This will probably have been discussed. The idea here is to drag Miri and Nirkam across each other. And for the fields that we're talking about, equatorial fields, uh, you're quite limited in the angles you can do. And so we'll observe in four epochs, twice in Cosmos and twice in UDS. If things go really well, we could be on sky April, May, right at the beginning of cycle one for the first epoch uh, Cosmos observations. Uh, and, and basically we flip it after six months so we can drag Miri across where Nurkan was and vice versa. And these are what the coverage maps look like. This is a bit busy for this kind of call. It's sort of tidier in Cosmos. It's slightly more difficult in the UDS because the UDS is a, a kind of east-west field. And I'll just uh, leave that up to finish. You can see here, if you look in detail, what I said about media, it gets to about 25 and a half, whereas NERCAM gets to 28 and a half, 29. And overall, we have about 220 square art minutes of overlapping media and NERCAM imaging from this survey. And I'll leave that up because there's details there and stop there, Steve. Great, thank you, Jim, very much. So we'll take uh, just a very short pause to give people a chance to uh, write their questions. And when you're ready, Steve, you can ask the first one. Yeah, we have one anonymous question, so I'll, I'll jump ahead and ask this one. Um, I think this is a question for both Jim and Jehan and Caitlin. Um, where there is an overlap, I guess, for the Cosmos field, do you plan on incorporating each of us data into your public data releases? Uh, well, I can, from my point of view, the answer is yes, but the the impact in terms of depth with the most limited filters in Cosmos and the slightly, uh, what we haven't looked at carefully really is where the, the strips of uh, media imaging in the Cosmos uh, strategy, where that overlaps with here. Uh, we will incorporate it, but the impact in the overall depth here will be fairly minimal. 
Thanks. <clears throat> Only questions so far. Let's see if any others pop up quickly. I can ask a quick one, Jim. So you probably have a number of uh, different observing windows because you have different epochs and multiple fields. Um, when do you think your earliest public data release will be? Well, I think it will be towards the end of the cycle because it's not until the end of the cycle that we'll get uh, the, the overlapping imaging from, I mean, it will kind of start off as a separate NERCAM and, and MIRI data set, and then therefore we'll, we'll kind of analyze that separately and produce draft catalogs separately there. Uh, the, the plan basically is to try and do an early data release to the consortium to see how we're getting on if, if the data quality is matching up. But to, to do a, a data release fairly shortly after the finish of cycle one, as soon as we've got the full overlapping imaging in both, um, in both fields. But of course, the raw data will be instantly publicly available to anyone who wants as soon as it comes off the pipeline. Great. Okay. Well, we don't have any other questions. So thank you very much, Jim, for sharing Primer with us.